Color guard, retire the colors. Ladies and gentlemen, Lieutenant Commander Paul Smith, Chaplain Corps, United States Navy, will now offer the invocation. So please join me in prayer. Gracious God, we would ask that you would hear on behalf of the citizens of this great nation our endearing gratitude for the members of Underwater Construction Team 1, Detachment November Mike, 1985. Theirs is a story that was and is known to people across the world, but to us, the story is very personal, illuminating the caliber of the women and men of the U.S. Navy's exclusive cadre of construction divers. Having gruelingly earned the title of Navy Diver, the sixth man of Det Detachment November Mike would in due course distinguish themselves even more as captives of an ideology opposed to every good and just thing they represented and supported in places and climes across the globe. Duty, freedom, honor, courage, commitment, and self-sacrifice are just a few of the enduring values these men embodied. And we stand here today to vigorously articulate as representatives of our great land that these values do sustain us in the valley of death's shadow and are even greater than ourselves and do at times claim the supreme sacrifice mirrored by Petty Officer Robert Steedham. These men represent the finest grit and fiber of the citizen warriors that rise up to serve and wear the cloth of our proud sea service tradition. Let this ceremony serve to remind us of the awesome and demanding responsibility that accompanies freedom. We pray your abiding grace on the families and friends of the sailors, marines, soldiers, airmen, and coast guardsmen who have given their lives in service to this country. And of the men and women who are even now in harm's way, we pray their safe and sure return in your strong name that I pray, amen. Guests, please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the ceremony to recognize the members of Underwater Construction Team 1, Detachment November Mike 85, whose actions during the events of June 1985 we honor here today. It is now my honor to introduce Rear Admiral Martha Herb, U.S. Navy Director, Inter-American Defense College. Good morning. I hope you're warm enough. Whoever thought that we'd have to worry about the temperature on this fine day in April. Secretary Mavis, Rear Admiral Gregory, Rear Admiral Fowler, Rear Admiral Morneau, Rear Admiral Yabar, Rear Admiral Morton, Rear Admiral Drennan, Rear Admiral Nash, Rear Admiral Boone, family of Petty Officer Robert Stevedum, divers of UCT-1, Det November, Mike, 85, veterans of Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan. It is my honor and privilege to welcome you to the Inter-American Defense College. For a moment, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this great facility. We are an international senior service college chartered under the auspices of the Organization of American States and hosted by the United States at Fort McNair. Our students hail from 14 different nations in the Western Hemisphere. 33% of our graduates have become flag officers or general officers, ministers, ambassadors, and high-ranking government officials, and even three have become presidents. IADC serves as tangible evidence of the shared cooperation and relationship building between the United States and the Americas. We at IADC are extremely honored to host this ceremony in which these distinguished members of UCT-1 Det November Mike 85 will be awarded the Prisoner of War Medal. To the Steedums, we can never fill the space left in your heart from the parting of your son. But we can show you that he is not forgotten. To our special guest, we are so proud to honor your service for answering the call to duty. Less than 1% of our population volunteer to serve in the armed forces. Of those, only an, a few, an elite few 
rise to the challenge of becoming Navy divers. These are the ones who conquered the rigorous dive school training program and earned the right to serve proudly as Huya Navy Deep Sea Divers. It is this community's tenacious, can-do way of thinking and approach to life that makes this momentous occasion finally possible. Take a moment, look to your left, to your right. Every Navy diver present today is connected to these men through our diving community. George Seltzer, who commanded Underwater Construction Team 1, was my classmate at the then Navy School of Diving and Salvage in Washington, D.C. Yes, I'm that old. <laughs> I will never forget the day, years later, when George related to me it was his team of UCT divers on the hijacked TWA plane that filled the headlines in newspapers and flooded TV reports across the country. The emotion in George's eyes told the story. Kenneth Bowen served as one of my diving chiefs at Mobile Diving Salvage Unit 2, Debt 608. I had never connected his name with the divers on the TWA flight until he shared his story. For 30 to 45 minutes, I sat spellbound as he narrated the story of his team, the pain he felt in losing his shipmate, Robert Steedham, and the stress those divers endured during their captivity. I hold him and his courageous shipmates in high esteem for their courage. Jeff Ingalls served with my husband and me at the Navy Diving and Salvage Training Center in Panama City. So for a moment, permit me to share a little bit of how this ceremony transitioned from an idea or a notion to reality. It's a story of different sailors from different dive school classes working together and believing that yes was the only acceptable answer to getting the Prisoner of War Medal awarded to these men. Bobby Scully, retired Navy captain and deep sea diver, told me about a project that she was working on through the Navy Diver Foundation. This project was conveyed to her by retired bosun mate and Purple Heart recipient, Keith Reyes. Do you see how the divers stick together? She explained they were creating a justification package to award the Prisoner of War Medal for the sacrifice of the divers during the TWA hijacking and for their time in captivity as hostages. We brainstormed a few courses of action, trying to figure out how to fast track the packet for approval. And I'll leave that part out of the story. But thanks to the diligence of the secretary's staff, we are here today for this ceremony. What a thrill to be included in a project to honor our own divers. An opportunity to give back to the team members who suffered so much a chance to honor the family whose son gave his all. I salute these Navy divers and these Navy Seabees. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my honor to introduce Rear Admiral Kate Gregory, United States Navy Commander, Naval, Naval Facilities Engineering Command, and the Chief of Civil Engineers. Good morning, Secretary Mavis, the men of Underwater Construction Team 1, Det November Mike 85, and their families, Admiral Morneau, Admiral Fowler, Admiral Morton, Admiral Drennan, Admiral Nash, Admiral Boone, Admiral Wagner, Admiral Yabar, Captain Schatz, uh, distinguished friends, veterans, uh, service members serving today in uniform, and past and present. Thank you all for being here today. This is indeed a momentous day. As Admiral Erb said, Today we are really recognizing a unique group of men, unique for many ways. Unique because they chose to serve their nation, unique to cho because they chose to serve in the Navy, unique because they endured the rigorous training to be Navy divers, that elite group, and unique because they also chose to be Seabee divers, underwater construction divers. Let me give you a brief history of the Seabees. It is short because the Seabees are a, a tiny part of our Navy and a relatively new part of our Navy. Seabees were established in the Second World War 
because our nation knew that there was a, a need for a unique capability. And so that those men were trained to be able to fight on those battlefields of World War II in the Atlantic and the Pacific. And they earned that reputation for can do and we build, we fight. And they were trained for that particular battle and their icon is Ben Morrell, Admiral Morrell, who is the father of the Seabees. That tradition carried on through Korea and Vietnam. And in Vietnam, those battlefields were Southwest Asia. And that icon is a Petty Officer Marvin Shields and CB Team 0411. And they were able to fight that fight because we prepared them for that environment, that special skill they needed to fight the communist threat. But the men we're honoring today were not well prepared because we did not understand what that enemy was or what that battlefield was going to be. Those brave men instead displayed the honor, the courage, and commitment then that all of our sailors and officers aspire to demonstrate today. They showed honor in the spirit of our nation. They showed courage in the face of that tremendous strain placed on them while they were held hostage. And they were committed to fight, to fight together for their team, for their mission, and for their nation. That is the kind of dedicated service that we are here to honor today. And so it is my privilege to introduce our guest speaker, who really exemplifies also that dedicated service. We are fortunate today indeed to have Secretary Mavis because he knows the CB well, CBs well, having served as the governor of the great state of Mississippi. He understands naval service, having served as a naval officer. He understands the international community and our commitment to our partner nations, having served as the ambassador to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And he understands what it is to lead our military, serving as the 75th Secretary of the Navy. Please join me in welcoming Secretary Mavis. Thank y'all all, and forgive me for wearing a coat in here. Um, I'm from Mississippi. <laughs> this time in April, it's not supposed to be this cold. So, Admiral Kate Gregory, Admiral Martha Herb, thank you for, thank you all for being here to mark such a special, if long overdue occasion. And thank you retired Captain Bobby Scully and Commander George Seltzer for getting this ball rolling for your letters to me to urging that this be done. And most importantly, thank you to the many friends and family who loved and supported these courageous men through the terror they withstood and beyond. Through the many years, they all continue to serve our country with loyalty and humility. I'm proud to be here with you today to honor such bravery and such service. Today, images of extremist violence and the atrocities of groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda dominate our news. Young men and women joining our Navy and Marine Corps today have grown up in an America with its new adversary, undefined, extremist, vicious, unconventional. What we know now that we didn't know on the morning of June 14, 1985, is that we had entered a new era, both of peacekeeping and warfighting, that would fundamentally have change how we train and how we operate. Stuart Dahl, Tony Watson, Jeffrey Ingalls, Kenneth Bowen, Clinton Suggs, Robert Stenham, all first and second class petty officers, got on a plane for home that was hijacked by the extremist network Hezbollah. What they endured on board that plane for the next 24 hours and in captivity for the 17 days that followed is a suffering that only those few who have shared similar experiences can ever fully comprehend. These six then young Seabees, never exposed to this particular type of enemy action, conducted themselves with dignity and courage in the face of immense brutality. To lose a friend, a shipmate, at any time is terrible and heartbreaking. 
but for the five men here to watch an enemy take the life of their countryman, their fellow CB, Robert Stenham. This was before being taken captive, rendering that time for them even crueler as they were forced to swallow their grief, faithfulness, and maintain the faithfulness we've come to expect from a U.S. service member. And in this, they never faltered. When I talk about the Navy and Marine Corps, I talk about our presence around the globe, around the clock. As America's away team, our sailors and our Marines are in the right place all the time, providing our nation's leaders with options, times of crisis, equally in times of peace and war. And our ability to provide that presence is built on four fundamentals. People, our sailors and Marines, platforms, power, and partnerships, our strong relationships around the world. But people come first for a reason. Our sailors are the life force and the energy that drive the Navy. And opportunities like today to recognize that unique Navy, that unique American spirit, fills us all with immense pride. And one of the ships providing that global presence today is DDD-63, the USS Denham. In the first year of her service, Stenham earned the U.S. Coast Guard Meritorious Unit Commendation Medal for search and rescue efforts for survivors of an Air Force C-130 downed off the coast of California. A ship's namesake imbues that platform, its crew, its mission, with its spirit. And the Stenham is a great, great example of that. Destroyers are named for people who have displayed great valor. And although Petty Officer Robert Stenham is not here to receive the medal today, the ship that bears his name will continue to honor his memory and his heroism for decades to come through the sailors who have served and will continue to serve aboard that great ship and through all who come in contact with the ship. Now this award was not authorized at the time of the tragic event and so it is far, far past you. Every one of you five went on to serve the Navy for many years after this awful event. Through those years, you served honorably and helped shape the young men and women of the fleet that we have today. With exemplary nature, with the exemplary nature in which you handled the worst of times. I'm privileged to be able to present this medal to each of you so that you know the Navy recognized the courageous action you took almost 30 years ago. But also, so Americans everywhere are reminded of exactly who the brave men and women of their Navy and Marine Corps are that defend their freedom and exactly what the cost of that defense looks like. To the parents of Robert Steele, Thank you for bearing this loss. And in the words of Lincoln, for laying such a costly sacrifice on the altar of freedom. Thank you all for your distinguished service, both in June 1985 and in the years that followed. From me, from the Department of the Navy, and from the people of this nation, you are the epitome of Semper Fortis, forever courageous.
Ladies and gentlemen, please rise as the Prisoner of War Medal is read. From Secretary of the Navy to Engineering Aide First Class, Diver, Stuart Dahl. Construction Electrician First Class, Diver, Tony Watson. Equipment Operator First Class, Diver, Jeffrey Ingalls. Steel Worker Second Class, Diver, Kenneth Bowen. Construction Electrician Second Class, Diver, Clinton Suggs. Steel Worker Second Class, Diver, Robert Steedham. I am pleased to inform you that I have approved the Prisoner of War Medal for your de detainment during the hijacking of TWA Flight 847 in June 1985. Although this recognition is very late in coming, it is truly deserved. By all counts, you and your fellow sa sailors demonstrated courage and fortitude under extreme conditions, and this medal represents our nation's gratitude for the sacrifices you made. Thank you for your dedicated and honorable service to the Navy. Sincerely, Ray Mavis, Secretary of the Navy. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated as the Secretary of the Navy presents the Prisoner of War Medal to the five surviving members of Underwater Construction Team 1, Detachment November Mike, 85, and to the parents of Petty Officer Robert D. Steedham. Commander George H. Seltzer, United States Navy, retired. The former commanding officer of Underwater Construction Team 1 will read the names and remarks about each sailor as he comes forward for his award. <clears throat> Engineering aid first class and diver, Stuart L.J. Dahl. United States Navy. Dahl's highest attained rank at retirement was Lieutenant CEC USN. Dahl is a native of Thief River Falls, Minnesota and entered the U.S. Navy in October 1974. As an enlisted man, he served with NMCB 133 at Gulfport. He served three tours with UCT-1. He was selected as Sailor of the Year for the Atlantic Fleet Seabees in 1985. He earned the rank of Chief Petty Officer in 1985, and he received a commission as Limited Duty Officer Ensign in the Civil Engineer Corps in 1986. As an officer, he then was assigned to NCTC, Port Wanimi, to the Naval Civil, Civil Engineering Laboratory, also in Port Wanimi, Marine Corps Base Camp, Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, and finally, to the Naval Security Group activity, Sugar Grove, West Virginia, where he retired in 1997. EA-1 Dahl was held by the Amal Militia in Beirut for 19 days. Construction electrician, first class diver, Tony D. Watson, United States Navy. Watson's highest attained rank at retirement was CWO3, CEC, USN. Watson, a native of Hickory, North Carolina, entered the U.S. Navy in April 1978. As an enlisted man, he served one tour with NMCB-1, completed Navy diver second class training at Harbor Clearance Unit 2 in Little Creek in 1981. He served two tours with UCT-1, one tour with UCT-2. Shore duty commands included CBU-418, Bangor, Washington, and NCTC in Port Wanimi. He was commissioned Chief Warrant Officer in May 1992. He served as Operation Officer for UCT-1 and UCT-2 and Delta Company Commander at NCTC. CE-1 Watson was held by the Amal Militia in Beirut for 19 days.
Equipment Operator, First Class Diver, Jeffrey J. Ingalls, United States Navy. Ingalls' highest attained rank at retirement was EQCM, CB Combat Warfare Specialist, Master Diver. Ingalls entered the Navy in July 1978 and attended basic training at Recruit Training Command, Great Lakes. His sea duty command uh, assignments included Naval Station ADAC, Alaska, and three tours with UCT-1. His shore duty assignments included Commander Naval Construction Battalions Atlantic, UCT-1, and the Naval Diving and Salvage Training Center in Panama City, Florida. He retired from the Navy in July 1998 as Command Master Chief of UCT-1. EO-1 Ingalls was held by the Hezbollah in Beirut for 19 days. Steelworker Second Class Diver Kenneth M. Bowen, United States Navy. Bowen's highest attained rank at retirement was CUCM Diver. Bowen, a native of St. Petersburg, Florida, joined the Navy's delayed entry program in December 1978 while finishing his senior year in high school. His active duty assignments included Amphibious Construction Battalion 1 and UCT-1. He then left active duty and transferred to the Naval Reserve Force assigned to a RNMCB-14 detachment in St. Petersburg, Florida. Bowen transferred to the Naval Diving and Salvage Unit 2 detachment at Mayport Naval Station in Jacksonville in 1986 and remained a member of that unit until his retirement in April 2004 as the Command Master Chief. SW-2 Bowen was held by the Amal Militia in Beirut for 19 days. Construction Electrician Second Class Diver Clinton L. Suggs, United States Navy. Suggs' highest attained rank at retirement was CE-1, CB uh, co Combat Warfare Specialist Diver. Hailing from Elkhart, Indiana, Suggs joined the Navy in October 1980, reporting to basic training in San Diego, where he was recognized as outstanding recruit. After completing his first duty assignment at the Public Works Department, Naval Facility Argencia, Newfoundland, Canada, he briefly transferred to St. Nicholas Island, California before enrolling in Second Class Dive School in 1984. Upon graduation, Suggs was assigned to UCT-1, where he served until 19, uh, 1994. He was then assigned to PWC Pearl Harbor, where he received the Sail Over the Year Award. He returned to UCT-1, for his final tour before retiring in November 2000. CE2 Suggs was held by the Amal Militia in Beirut for 19 days. Steel worker, second class diver, Robert D. Steedham, United States Navy. Steedham, a native of Waterbury, Connecticut, entered the U.S. Navy in May 1981 and attended basic training at Recruit Training Command, Great Lakes. His sea duty assignment included multiple deployments to Guam, San Diego, or Guam, uh, Diego Garcia, and other locations with NMCB 62 and UCT 1. 
His personal awards included the Bronze Star and the Purple Heart. You all know the story. Robbie was brutally murdered on 15 June 1985 by Hezbollah terrorist on TWA Flight 847 while returning from a diving assignment in Neomakri, Greece. Only a month earlier, Master Chief Joel Erholzer and I were accepted a challenge by Robbie to a swimming contest across Frederickstead Harbor in St. Croix, Virgin Islands. Excuse me. When we were deployed on a diving job, youth won the day, I'm sad to say. <laughs> <laughs> to honor Rob for his duty, honor, and courage, the U.S. Navy named Aegis Destroyer, the USS Steedham, DDG-63, to Rob. Rob's parents, Patricia and Richard, are accepting his award today. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the benediction and remain standing for the departure of the official party. Chaplain Smith will now give the benediction. Let us pray. God, as we depart this hallowed ground and return to our daily lives, may we be stirred to reflect in our own lives those qualities we have honored here with resolute fearlessness and an uncompromising valor. It's in your very strong name that I pray.